Um, so uh, just a welcome that you've all met me since I've been running around, but um, thank you for coming. Thank you, Eva, for joining us. Um, uh, welcome to the European Union Study Center. Hi, Barbara. We're part of the Ralph Lynch Institute here at the Graduate Center. Um, we promote events like this, um, uh, workshops. We have this actually time is the exact time of our um, CUNY Reese workshop that meets um, every month coordinated by myself and Mark Lewis back here. And Lucas is a regular attendee. Um, and we invite uh, researchers to give, um, to share their research and progress for feedback. Um, we have a number of other events coming up this semester, public events, and um, we, uh, we're very glad you're here. It's really nice to see people in person. So thank you. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Meryl. Thank you very much. Thank sure. you, CUNY, for the invitation. Thank you, Yasse, for the intervention. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. I uh, apologize that it's been a little bit of a fuffle with how to operate. We, but a little DIY today. Yeah. But. <laughs> uh, so uh, my book, which is right up there, Crossing the Bridges, was published in London in uh, June oh, of yeah, 20. Say something to introduce it. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, to introduce it. Yeah, you were. Yeah. But thank you so much for the opportunity. It's it's a great honor to introduce Dr. Eva um, Hoffman Yendru, such an amazing and inspirational person I know for a few years now, with an incredible story, a story she's going to share in just a few minutes. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, for me personally, this story is important really sort of on two levels. And first is that it really sort of gaps, uh, fills in a gap, historical gap. Because many times in classrooms, we jump from major topic to a major topic. So we focus on World War II, the Holocaust. And then we sort of talk about European recovery, uh, the Nuremberg trials, the beginning of the Cold War. But, but for that tens of thousands of people, this was really a beginning of a second chapter of suffering and pain, ultimately, finding their close ones, their loved ones being separated during World War II. And even though that sometimes maybe people would know where their loved ones are, that they did survive, it was very difficult to get to them, if not impossible, because crossing the border from the West into Soviet-occupied Poland was extremely dangerous, sometimes even deadly, and vice versa, ultimately. So that sort of second chapter of pain and suffering continued for many, many people. On another level, um, I love the book because it gives a very personal touch to history that goes beyond just politics and maps um, and statistics. Ultimately, it, it, it shows a story of two people, their life, growing up, ambitions, dreams, hard work, eventually getting married, and basically finding happiness happiness that will be taken away in a matter of hours as the first bombs ultimately are dropped on Poland. And so it not only kind of gives us a more personal connection with the past and people in the past, but also better allows us to understand even the stories of many people today, because it once again appeared in these regions, in Lviv, Lviv even today with the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So I'm sure in the next few years, stories which are gonna be similar will sort of come out even today of families being happy, preparing themselves to go to work, to school, and then in a matter of hours, their lives ultimately shatter, shattered. So that's just my two thoughts on this book itself, but I'll give the voice to Dr. Yeah, thank you very much. I really appreciate. Uh, so uh, the book Crossing the Bridges was published in June of 2021 in London. And it, it came out as a World War II memoir. Now, since the invasion of, by Russia of the Ukraine, it really became part of current affairs because what happened 80 years ago is a mirror image of what is happening now over the same lands, actually. Uh, now, it's a story within a story. It's like, or shall I say, a story of a land and the story of a person. They are intertwined because the person and the land are joined at the hip, so to speak, like two spirals that sort of move in tandem as the conflicts evolve, so does the fate of the main character in the story who happens to be my mother. 
and the land is Poland, or I would say rather Poland's most eastern province, uh, the one that borders on Russia or at that time on the Soviet Union, uh, which of course was after the Russian Revolution of 1917. And the person is my mother, who was, whose name was Sophie. You know, as I prepared myself for this, I realized that it's pretty futile to try to describe a person, um, locate a person in their history by a single date, which in, in this case would have been 1939, the outbreak of World War II, like you said, from World War II onwards. But there was a whole lot of stuff that occurred before World War II. And I think it's that period, especially in, in the case of Poland, and I'll explain why, that actually formed, in my mother's case, her personality. Now, uh, you know, now, are you going to screw it up? Poland is, uh, of course, part of Central, uh, Central Eastern Europe. Europe. Oh, oh, somebody, somebody yeah. hooked up. Um, it's it's a, the whole that whole region for three hundred years was an extremely difficult and complex uh, territory. For one main uh, reason is that the borders there shifted with absolutely dizzying speed for 300 years. This is the 17th century map. And as you can see, Poland was the largest country at that point in Europe. Uh, it was the uh, Commonwealth of two nations, the Kingdom of Poland and the uh, Grand Duchy of Lithuania. And it stretched from the Baltic in the north to the uh, Black Sea in the south. It's surprising, it surprises people who don't follow history to know that in 200 years later, this largest country in Central and Eastern Europe disappeared from the map of Europe altogether. <clears throat> so 100 years later, uh, 18th century, 1700s, this is what uh, this region looks like at the beginning of 17th century, uh, I mean 18th century. Uh, Poland is still significant size, but it's shrinking because it has neighbors on both sides uh, who are very aggressive and who are expanding. The Tsardom of Russia and to the south, is the Habsburg monarchy. And throughout that 18th century, Poland is losing territory to them. They're encroaching uh, ever, ever more. Now, this whole conglomerate of little uh, dukedoms, princedoms, which are uh, to the, to the um, west, west, no, east of Poland, um, West of Poland, um, those are the ones that eventually join into the uh, Prussian Kingdom of Prussia. Those are little, little dukedoms, um, uh, uh, which eventually under Russia got consolidated. So this is another major European power which is growing up right on Poland's doorstep and very aggressive. Unfortunately. Throughout that 18th century, Poland had a very, very stormy domestic history. There were, Poland is a, and I don't want to go into the history of that because it would take another two days to explain it, but Poland being a monarchy had elected, not like most European monarchies, which were dynastic. Uh, this was, started back from 1400s when Poland developed a bicameral parliament, probably unique in Europe, two chambers, the 
Senate and the Chamber of Deputies, which uh, grew in power and tried to control the uh, royal uh, power. So this was a tug of war. And eventually that tug of war evolved into severe conflict between powerful uh, families, between Poland's elites. The country became more and more weakened while the neighbors, the Russian uh, Empire, the Habsburg Empire, and the growing Prussia uh, were becoming more uh, aggressive. So where, by the time the Poles realized that the country was going into severe decline, well, they tr the, the elites, uh, the political elites tried to uh, counteract a uh, major parliamentary session, which lasted four years, trying to uh, reform the system. Unfortunately, it was too late. In 1793, the Polish parliament passed the most liberal constitution uh, in Europe, and it was based on the uh, French Declaration of the Rights of Man, and the American Constitution. And both of them, of course, were products of two revolutions. And that was not acceptable to the three um, adjoining uh, absolutist monarchies. So in, seven, uh, of course, the, uh, it, Poland was attacked. And eventually, in two years later, Poland was dismembered by the three absolutist empires. Russian, Russian, Austro-Hungarian, and literally disappeared from the map of Europe. Uh, parts, the, the partitioning powers took large chunks. My family uh, comes from the southeastern part, and uh, that entire uh, province fell to Austro-Hungary. Uh, with, a, with a, its principal city known as the Lvov, City of Lions, or in Latin it was called Leopolis, which is today's uh, Ukrainian Lviv, and uh, the, the, which became the provincial capital of the province, the Austro Hungarian province of Galician. Uh, all that part in the green up on top, that is. Uh, Galician, nothing to do with the Spanish Galicia, <laughs> but uh, and Lvov, which was renamed or not changed the name to Lemberg, became the provincial capital. Now, what was very interesting about the city was. Um, that it was one probably had the most diverse population, ethnically speaking, in Europe, uh, in Poland. Uh, the city was sitting for centuries on a very busy merchant caravan trail, going north to, uh, coming from the north to, uh, down to the Black Sea and back, carrying uh, from the south, carrying spices, silks, uh, jewels, and bringing uh, weapons, metal objects, and amber from the north down. Uh, those were merchant caravans, and those merchants were not necessarily Poles. They were or, or locals, so to speak. They were um, Armenians, they were Jews, they were Scots, they were uh, Germans, uh, Tatars. Now, of course, Poland also bordered on the Tatar Khanate, which is, of course, today's Crimea. So uh, as those caravans proceeded throughout the centuries, people eventually settled in, uh, in that particular province, in the city of Lvov. It became extremely ethnically diverse and very wealthy because those were traders, those were merchants. So, uh, and Poland is the most eastward country. I, I don't want to go back to the, the other map of Poland, but it's the most eastward country that belongs uh, 
to the Western Latin civilization. I call it the Church of Rome, if you will, that way. Beyond that, it's all, all is Orthodox Byzantine or Muslim. Consider that, that that's uh, going further east or also Mongol lands. So that, there was a smattering of everything there. Now, that being a Latin civilization as compared to the Byzantine also create also um, cultural uh, differences between the various ethnic groups. Now, for, uh, uh, for, you know, for a number of years before of the um, 19th century, uh, the diplomacy of four great powers of Europe, because you have to add also, of course, the Ottoman Empire, they really waltzed towards a catastrophe. On 28th June 1914, Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria and his wife Sophia uh, were assassinated by uh, Serbian nationalists. And on 28th June 1914, Austria declared war on Serbia. And soon the rest of the world joined in. And after five years of relentless bloodshed, the Great War ended on 11 November 1918, Armistice Day, as we know, at a human cost of 20 million soldiers dead, 21 million uh, wounded, it was a tremendous human cost. Now, while the uh, The uh, crucial year, as I said in my story, would be 1939. But my, my mother's personality was not fashioned in one particular year by one particular uh, outbreak of uh, conflict. It was shaped by a number of years that uh, there were different, uh, how shall I say, there were significant changes occurring and she was very much growing up as a child, an ad uh, adolescent, and even young adult, uh, where these changes impacted her. Now, um, I want to show which will explain this. The shifting of borders, which introduced such huge changes. My mother was born in 1905. She was an Austrian citizen when she was born. Uh, 1912, she took her first Holy Communion as an Austrian citizen in the city of Lemberg. Seven years later, she went to high school as a Polish citizen in the city of Lwów, which was the same Lemberg. They went back to the original Polish name of Lwów. And these things were pr produced enormous changes. So, uh, The outcome of the Great War, of course, was that the four great empires uh, disintegrated. And when they disintegrated, all these independent little states started forming their own uh, uh, sovereignties, and including Poland, of course. Now, just before the end of the war, the Russian Revolution broke out. And, and the Soviet Union was intent on spreading communism uh, worldwide. So within uh, a year and a half after Armistice Day, Russia attacked Poland, which was a very weakened state at that point, of course, uh, uh, because uh, for some reason, Mr. Lenin believed that Warsaw was the uh, hotbed of capitalism. And the Treaty of Versailles restored Poland's uh, boundaries to its former boundaries, uh, which reunited three partitioned territories. Now, why was that important? Let me just, uh, this is just a map from 1918 to 1938, the 20 year period between the two wars. So this, this is the result of the uh, Treaty of Versailles. Now, Poland became a, st its, a new, well, recovered its statehood 
But what happened? Poland <laughs> recovered it on Armistice Day, November 11th, 1918. There was no parliament, there was no constitution, there was no head of state, there was no government, there was no foreign representation. And there was a population of 21 million, which for those were five generations of Poles who had lived for 120 you know, years between the partition and the recovery of independence as Russian, Prussian, Austrian citizens with different legal systems, languages, and customs. And the Poles were told, you're now free, make your own state. It was quite an undertaking. Well, there were, of course, political uh, thinkers and elites who had been preparing for that even throughout the last years of uh, 19, uh, of the uh, 19th century. And uh, the first thing they did was uh, to uh, ask Marshal Józef Piłsudski, who was the wartime hero from World War I, as interim head of state. They named him interim head of state. Uh, Piłsudski immediately reached out for Poland's 300-year-old parliamentary tradition. And he immediately called for elections. So within two months after Poland regaining independence, elections were called for a constitutional parliament that would be now working for the to uh, write the constitution for forming the government and so on. Those elections were held in the entire territory, but not they couldn't be all held on that particular date everywhere because there were still conflicts with the previous owners of the lands who were still very, very active or who didn't want to give up certain parcels along borders or who didn't want to restore some of the land that they had actually captured in uh, the partition period. So. Uh, this this was not a, a uniform, smooth election, you know, on Tuesday, November 1st, Tuesday of November, and we all go to vote. This was piecemeal election, which had to be held. Uh, actually, the majority, of course, was held on that date, but then there were uh, bits and pieces of it, which stretched for about three or four months. In the, so it wasn't easy. And also, bear in mind, that even the political leaders who emerged, they emerged from three different systems. Uh, the Prussian occupation of Poland was extremely repressive. Poles were not allowed to use Polish language in schools, not allowed to buy land. Um, there were German uh, settlers were brought over and, and uh, that was called the Haggadah, I believe, uh, the policy of settling uh, people in the land, and as was repressive also the Russian regime. What's different? Uh, there were a couple of major uprisings throughout those those years, and now you have and then the Austrian uh, occupation of Poland or partition of Poland was the really the least repressive, if you can say that. Poles were very much part of Austria. Austro-Hungary as citizens in politics and in everything. So there was a great deal of experience which was drawn in that part, which was my part of the country. In other words, people were experienced in parliamentary procedures in what was happening. But that doesn't mean that between the various leaders uh, who emerged, that there were no frictions. Still, uh, the, there were huge political changes, and they were both political and social. And one of the major ones, of course, universal suffrage. Women, Poland, after Great Britain, I believe, Poland was the second country which gave women the uh, right to vote, and women could also stand for elections. But there were also social changes. There was something that new woman, I call it, who emerged. There were changes in music, there were social changes which completely uprooted some of the old traditions. And women could contemplate going into higher education. 
Now, as you can see, those they changed the fashion. For example, my grandmother um, <clears throat> uh, sitting in a long gown with uh, with uh, laces and you know high collars, and then thirteen years later, she's sitting on that bench. She has the short skirt, you know, showing the the, the sacrosanct ankle, uh, and my mother dressed in a completely modern dresses, as as was my uncle, my brother. So those were changes which were if they, they or funny, but they really were very very significant because they were psychological changes. Uh, the same thing happened, for example, with things like boxing. The, the waltz, which was a very formal uh, dance, it gets replaced. It, it's still there, but now there's the Charleston from <laughs> New Orleans, and, uh, or, or, and uh, there is the tango from Argentina. So this is a completely different social interaction. And I think that had much to do with shaping my mother's personality. And of course, oh, and there was the flapper, the famous flapper, uh, Great Gatsby uh, brought that up. There, there was the symbol of the Roaring Twenties. And the Roaring Twenties were a time of enormous economic boom. This, of course, was worldwide. And people really loved, lived up to it. Now, in the meantime, things weren't doing that well because you have also the Soviet Union, which is starting to expand and expand westward, picking up all the smaller countries on the way and forming a basically a, a reef of 15 smaller countries which were turned into social Soviet socialist republics, among them Belarusia among them Kazakhstan, among them Ukraine. And uh, this was starting to form, and certainly the Soviet Union was doing whatever it could to foment unrest in the rest of the world. Both Germany and France were extremely weakened uh, after World War I, because both had lost a great deal of of male population, especially uh, 15 to 49. And uh, France demanded huge reparations from the uh, German uh, state for the war damages. So the uh, German economy was completely devastated. And then, of course, that brought Hitler to power. And in 29 January, Hitler became, of 1933, Hitler became the German chancellor on the way to dictatorship and Germany began to arm. <clears throat> so very soon after that, what followed of course would be the uh, annexation of Austria. So I'd love to hear the stories about your mother and how she experienced all of these trends in world history. Do you have some anecdotes to share? I'm sorry? Do you have some stories from the book about what your mother experienced through all of these trends in world history? Well, yes. One of the story is, for example, that she decided to follow higher education. Uh, and her, her age and her you know, social group, uh, young ladies who graduated from high school would immediately plunge into social life that would let, lead to marriage. My mother informed my, my grandparents that she wants to go to law school. My grandmother was devastated. And aunt said that my mother was going to uh, wither away an old maid among all these dusty volumes. My grandfather very much supported her. So she went, instead of doing the social thing, which she did too, but she then uh, went to law school and graduated as the third woman in Poland to have a law degree. Uh, she, uh, she also did her two years uh, apprenticeship uh, to take her examinations at the bar, and she got married. And married, my father was 12 years her senior. He was also a barrister, and uh, she became his junior partner. And that also created the new man. 
because it wasn't usual for a senior lawyer to take on his young wife as a partner. So those were the changes. But of course, in the meantime, things were not doing very well all over the world. There was the great crash of uh, 1929 on Wall Street, October, and uh, uh, this spread all across the world. Now, uh, I was the last addition to the family. Uh, I was born after my parents were married for nine years. I guess I came as a surprise. Uh, and this is the outbreak of World War II, which gets me finally to that 1939 um, year. There was a confidential protocol, which Germany and Russia well, there was a, a, a non-aggression pact which contained this confidential protocol. And uh, between the, the two, they decided to partition Poland. So on September 1st, 1939, German tanks, the Panzers, rolled across the border, crushing the barriers. And uh, there was a massive bombing of Warsaw and cities, the Luftwaffe, used um, incendiary bombs, which set the buildings uh, on fire across, across the country. And they were burning and glowing then for days. And on 17 September, which means you know, a little over two weeks later, the Soviet army marched into Poland from the east. It was a pincer grip, which the country could not possibly uh, survive. <laughs> So this is what the Soviet Union and Germany had agreed to do. That uh, pink part fell to uh, Russia. No, this one fell to, to Germany and the rest of what was Poland uh, became uh, part of the Soviet Union, Occu well, occupied by the, the Soviet army and that is the part of the country where my family comes from. That's the southeastern province, which was called Małopolska, uh, and then became, of course, that Galicia for the Austro-Hungary and, and back to Małopolska, and then just disappeared. So this is the demarcation line that ran through Poland according to that protocol. Uh, you can see it goes along the river Bug. Now, Russia occupied the, uh, you know, the entire, that entire eastern region, uh, the city of Lvov. Now, my father was a barrister, but he was also an officer in the reserves. He fought in World War I as well. And he was then part of the Austrian army because, because uh, uh, that was before, before the, uh, uh, World War I. So there were 15,000 Polish officers in that particular region, in that particular province. Uh, Russia signed a capitulation uh, with the Poles, which uh, uh, agreed to disarm the, the military, and then they could go free, uh, the soldiers could return home, uh, the officers to any country that would take them. Well, that didn't happen because the 15,000 Polish officers who disarmed were then rounded up and arrested and taken to three prisoner of war camps in uh, this uh, one in, in uh, Russia, one in Belarus, and one in Ukraine. My father was taken to the camp in Ukraine. Uh, the reason we knew, my mother knew about it because he was allowed to send a postcard home after the arrest. The only one that was. Now, within four months, Stalin signed a death warrant on the 15,000 officers. And this is a copy of, of the death mm -hmm. warrant and uh, the rest of his Politburo signed off on that. Now, uh, this is a very busy uh, slide. What I wanted to say was that 
uh, part goes from for the uh, officers and soldiers who were arrested by the Russians. There were many uh, hundreds, thousands of Polish soldiers, military, who escaped that pincer grip between Germany and Russia as the as it closed on the on the country, and those people uh, escaped through. Uh, Hungary and Romania, and then on to France and on to the British, uh, French uh, Allied forces. There were pilots afterwards who took part in the Battle of Britain, who were, um, uh, you know, there's a chapel in Westminster Abbey dedicated to two Polish squadrons, 302 and 303, uh, for their uh, contribution to the Battle of Britain. Now, what happened in Wolf? My mother, of course, is still in Wolf. Father was arrested. There were massive arrests of civil uh, service people and prominent citizens. Uh, the Russians immediately froze all bank accounts, so people were deprived of means. Uh, they also um, uh, devalued the Polish zloty, which was worth three Russian rubles to one on one parity. And uh, uh, private homes were, were requisitioned for Russian officers. My mother was kicked out of her apartment and was given to a, uh, a Russian colonel. Now, on, in February of 1940, the Russians start rounding up people in, uh, in Lvov and in that region for deportation to Siberia to hard labor. The labor camps, which were known as corrective labor camps and were managed by the chief directory of corre uh, corrective labor camps, was known by the popular name that most of us already know as Gulag. And the sites of the Gulag camps, which were being kept secret, by the way, uh, the Russians were denying that there were any hard labor camps. There were the mines around the Arctic Circle. One in particular was well known, it was called the Vorkuta mines. Uh, they, were, they were clearing the Siberian tiger, stone quarries for horses in Kazakhstan and so on. My mother was arrested. Oh, well, this is the map of the Gulag, which eventually got put together. And it's one of the uh, copies that's now at the Hoover Institute in California. When uh, I believe it was either Khrushchev or Brezhnev, when he visited the Hoover Institute, he denied that there were any labor camps in Russia, and he was shown this map. Now, that's another busy slide, which maybe I'll just summarize. My mother was arrested on April, uh, in April 1940, together with my grandmother, because she had moved to live with, uh, with me also together. I was then 18 months old. And she were, they were taken, uh, they were, um, shipped to Kazakhstan. Those were uh, transports that were going to um, hard labor uh, camps and quarries in Kazakhstan in particular. Uh, the deportees were usually packed like sardines into, I'm not sure you know, those were cattle cars. This is just happens to be two little children's heads uh, on the way to Siberia. But that was the typical transportation that the Russians used to ship people to the Soviet Union. And uh, in my book, I describe it because my mother left some uh, descriptions of the whole thing. Uh, those were people were packed like 70, 80, 90 to a cattle car. There were practically no hygiene uh, facilities. And Hardly any food was given during the 14 or the 20 day trip uh, to, to Russia. Uh, finally, they were dumped on the steps in Kazakhstan where they had to find their own lodgings for which they were charged, uh, find their own food. My mother was sent first to work in a farm and eventually in a stone quarry where she had to, uh, uh, well, that's a little later. 
uh, when uh, she had to load stones with her bare hands. There were no tools, there were no gloves. Of course, this work really cut the skin and eventually she picked up from some uh, uh, infected sheep, she picked up a, a tropical uh, fever called brucellosis, which was really supposed to kill her, but somehow miraculously didn't, she survived it. But that gave her the opportunity to experience uh, Soviet hospitals in the deep, of course, not in Moscow, but in the deep uh, Soviet Union, where conditions were appalling, where there were very few doctors. One who actually practically saved her life was a Tatar doctor from Crimea, who was himself a deputy. And uh, uh, there were practically no, no medicines. Uh, and the thing that not only my mother, but many other people mentioned, one of the real plagues of being in the Soviet Union were infestations with lice. Lice were ubiquitous, and therefore typhus was also ubiquitous. Now, eventually, Hitler decided he didn't like Mr. Stalin and decided to turn against. So the German army was forming for months along the Russian border, and Stalin would not accept that, that Hitler could betray him until on 23rd June, 1941, in operation called Operation Barbarossa, the German army crossed into Russia. This was supposedly Stalin disappeared for four or five days from sheer shock. Uh, the information eventually went across all of Soviet Union. Soviet Union had something like, I might be lying, 11 or 12 time zones and that information of the uh, German attack was proceeding across the entire Soviet Union. Now, Stalin had no choice but to join Britain and France against Germany. Now, in London, there was a Polish government in exile, as was, for example, General de Gaulle of France. And, uh, and there were now quite a significant number of Polish troops that had escaped that pincer group I keep going talking about, uh, that, that joined the Allied forces. They were fighting in uh, the British uh, campaign in North Africa against Germans, uh, General Rommel in Africa Corps. There were, uh, and there were all those remnants out of the one and a half million who were deported from my part of the country to uh, the Soviet Union. They estimated that there were still some 400,000 people left there. You could hardly call them able-bodied because those were people who were starved and, and usually very ill, but, but they were there, they were alive. And <clears throat> Stalin declared amnesty on Poles who were deported in 1940 allowing them to mobilize. And he had, his plan was to let them mobilize and then attach them to the Red Army. And my mother, well, there were, there were uh, recruitment points which were announced where a Polish army was forming, uh, trying to gather these people and, and uh, see how they could be used in the military effort. Uh, this am amnesty was declared across the entire Soviet Union. So I have some very interesting uh, parts of memoirs in my book about how people tried to desperately try to reach those recruitment uh, centers in any way they could across this enormous vast territory of the Soviet Union uh, in by river, with boats, drinking polluted water, dying of typhoid, uh, fever or typhus, um, yellow fever, you name it, but people were struggling to get to these recruitment points. Now, those recruitment points had groups of Polish doctors and nurses who had been deportees. So they were trying to create field hospitals there 
to treat these people, but they had absolutely no means, no medications. Doctors were operating by candlelight in the winter because there was no, no, there were no, you know, even no tents. And uh, so those were conditions which were very hard to uh, try to create something from the, 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 those people. Now, my mother, hoping that my father, of course, nobody knew about the executions, would, if he was still alive, he would try to make it to one of those recruitment centers. So she, with my grandmother, eventually made it to one of those recruitment centers. And that place, that was one center, which was very well known afterwards uh, in the Polish history of World War II, was called the camp of Buda, uh, Buzork in Kazakhstan. So the, the Polish survivors were instructed to get, uh, to go into uh, these recruitment centers and uh, what was created there was called the Polish army in the USSR. This, uh, those are two pictures of my mother and my grandmother when they were released from the uh, uh, in Kazakhstan uh, after the amnesty. Those are pictures of Polish children. That Polish army was trying desperately to salvage as many children as possible from the Russian orphanages. Because there were, of course, thousands of kids which were left without parents. See, they, some of them were very tiny. Uh, there was a story which I also included in my, in my uh, book of a boy Eight, eight year old, nine year old, uh, who was left alone with a couple year old sister in the Kokos, and the parents were dead. He heard that there were Polish people looking for children in that area. That's the camp uh, superintendent, if you want to call him that, was no, had no mind in helping him to find them. So he loaded the little girl on his back, walked for about eight days, and that was in the month of March, where there was still uh, snow, marshes, freezing weather, until he finally hit one of those recruitment centers. It was a story that made the rounds in the army. Now, the, the, the Polish army not only organized these uh, male units, but they also organized women's units. And because the, the intent was to salvage as many Polish citizens as possible from the Russian hell. And the, the women's auxiliary services were formed on the basis of the British ATS, which we call the Auxiliary Territorial Services. Uh, in Polish, it was abbreviated PWSK, PWSK. And my mother joined the army, and she's assigned to the military judiciary services. Actually, she, when she came there, I'm sure her condition was pretty wretched. She was assigned to the kitchens, and she spent the first month peeling rotten uh, potatoes and carrots until uh, paperwork was sorted. And then, because she was a lawyer, she was assigned to the uh, military judiciary. Conditions in this camp were not, you know, very easy. Those were very miserable little cabins with no heat, no nothing that the uh, Polish army was trying to set up. Uh, and uh, this lasted uh, several months when they were uh, trying to organize until Stalin declared that they were ready to be incorporated into the Red Army, to which the Poles said, no, we ain't going. We are not going. We are not going to find, to fight uh, shoulder to shoulder with the Russians. So of course, Stalin immediately cut off all the uh, Russians, uh, refused to supply any further uh, uniforms or anything, which they didn't very much in the, to begin with, and uh, cut off all further recruitment. So there were about 100,000 people who were 
did there and formed into sort of military units. Uh, there is a story also in my book about the British Navy supplying, well, the British Navy was supplying Russia by then with equipment, uh, sailing past uh, some of the uh, very dangerous spots like Nor Norway, which was the Ger occupied by Germany, and to the ports of Vladivostok uh, to supply the Russian um, equipment, which was being offered by the Allies. But they also supplied broad supplies for the Polish army there. So the first uniforms, uh, you can look at this, you know, this two different caps. My mother with uh, a colleague friend from another uh, woman in the army, they were so thankful to get these heavy winter coats, the military coats. Most of these uh, women, for the year or two years that they were in the, in the Soviet Union, they wore what they were taken with. They were rags. So a coat like this was, hey, this is like a gift from heaven. Now, eventually, uh, Stalin had no choice but to release those three, those, I believe, three divisions that formed on the, uh, in, in uh, Kazakhstan, the Polish units. The reason he couldn't uh, resist that anymore was because the German army was advancing further and further into, into Russia, and there was no choice but release them. So the Polish units left the USSR. I had a, a pointer somewhere which I plan to use from the port of Krasnovodsk across the Caspian Sea by ships to Persia, which was under British control. And that's where they joined the British uh, forces. Uh, there was a reorganization in, in uh, uh, of course, they started reorganizing across the entire uh, formation there, changed the name of the Polish army in the USSR to Polish army in the East, and then proceeded over time to cross through uh, Iran, Iraq, uh, into Palestine, which was then a, a British protectorate. And from there, they were joining other Polish units which deployed from Africa, and they were going to deploy to Italy to the Italian campaign. There was a funny story uh, of a little baby bear, bear cub, which was picked up by the Polish soldiers on the way from uh, across Persia. And this baby uh, cub, which grew to be a 4,000, a 400 pound bear, stayed with the Polish army, not only through the entire trek all the way to Italy, uh, took part in the Battle of Monte Cassino, but eventually was smuggled into Great Britain and ended up in the zoo in uh, Edinburgh, where there is a monument to, he was called Wojtek the soldier bear, and he was supposedly, the anecdote or story said that he helped carry ammunition, boxes of ammunition during the Battle of Monte Cassino. Uh, while my, my troops were in Iraq, my mother was sent to officer training camp in um, Sarafan in Palestine. That was the British officer's training camp where she spent over a month. And when she came back to join the, the rest of the troops, she, be, she was, uh, became platoon commander. Uh, that is a picture from uh, Iraq. Well, the, the, those are the, the details that I just uh, mentioned that, that uh, the whole uh, Polish unit expanded, where eventually it formed for well, all those Polish units when they gathered together, they became uh, the second Polish Corps and part of the British Eighth Army. Now, those are pictures from the various uh, you know, 
camps and all that. My mother never made it to Italy with the rest of the army. She was uh, summoned to London. Uh, she was unwilling to go because she didn't want to leave my grandma. My grandmother was with her all the time. My grandmother got the rank of senior private because she obviously was not <laughs> a recruited uh, age, but that was a way of saving her. And uh, uh, so the army said that if my mother agreed to be transferred to London, uh, then my grandmother would join her within six months, which indeed they promised. Now, when my mother got to London, she then was sent on to additional officer training camp in Aberdeen, Scotland. And even though my mother was nearsighted from birth, she did win a silver cup in the competitions at the end of the training uh, course from uh, pistol shooting. <laughs> so she said, well, she shot because she was nearsighted. She only could shoot by intuition. <laughs> and apparently she packed eight bullets into a little target somewhere. <laughs> I have this cup. There's a picture of my grandmother, my mother and my grandmother after my grandmother was sent to London. My mother then left. She was staying at the officer club uh, before my grandmother arrived. But obviously my grandmother was a private, so she couldn't stay in the British officer club. And uh, my mother took a room in a boarding house, which was very, very, very common during the war. Uh, across London. Of course, with London being so devastated, uh, lodgings were not easy to get. This is just a picture of my mother at the general headquarters in London. And this is just the picture at the end of the war, uh, I mean, the image of what uh, the Soviet Empire looked at the end of World War II. Those are all the uh, small republics which uh, uh, which, uh, which Russia can captured for itself. The Warsaw Pact in, uh, in 1955 left Poland as part of uh, the Soviet Union uh, zone of influence. So while the small social Soviet socialist republics were an integral part of the Soviet Union. These larger ones, like the Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Poland, were nominally uh, independent, which of course was uh, totally untrue because they were completely controlled by, uh, by Moscow. Now, when the war ended, I was in Poland because when my mother was arrested and my grandmother, I was on the, I was 18 months old and many, many, many Polish children were taken by the Russians with their parents and many Polish mothers buried their kids along the railroad tracks on the way to Siberia. I was just plain lucky. The soldiers who came to arrest my mother and my grandma, or the soldiers, one of them claimed that I had to be included and I had something like flu or whooping cough or something, which made me look really very sick. And the guy decided not to take it. So that's why I'm giving you this presentation today. Otherwise I probably would not. Now, the situation was as follows. My mother was in London. I was in Poland, occupied basically still by the Russian army. And any chance of our reunion was slim. My mother, especially by then, she was Lieutenant Colonel. She was a staff officer. She could not go into Poland because if she were captured, she, she would be immediately put on trial as a spy and executed or shipped back to the Gulag, which was same thing. And the border was very tight. There was, it was extremely difficult to uh, get people out of, out of Poland or any other of these countries which were separated by what 
soon Winston Churchill would call the Iron Curtain. So my mother was had this dead dilemma. How was she to recover? That is the sequel to her story, actually. Uh, uh, so, yes, she did recover me. And it was a sort of a cat and mouse story with a vial of cyanide pills in her pocket, but she didn't follow me. That is the first breakfast that we have after, well, our escape. And picture taken in West Germany where the Polish uh, uh, troops were standing the first Polish armored division was there. And that's where my mother left me within a few days to have to return to London. Her going into Poland to get me out was totally illegal because of the fact that she could have been captured and then this could be used as a political incident. So this is at first the first picture of her and myself uh, in the officer's mess in a little town called Meppen in West Germany. And I have another picture where, which was taken when I was taken on a visit of the Krupp, the steel uh, works of Krupp, which was supplying the uh, cannons and uh, iron works for for the German army, and I was taken there on an excursion to those experimental fields. I have this picture. Looking through a wall which was day thick, which was being used to test the cannon walls. Uh, this was this this whole uh, area looked like a moonscape. It was littered with and. So this is where the history is now. Now, oh, let me just finish this. Uh, why, why I said that this is part of current affairs. So the war lasted six years, and throughout that time, my mother and I were separated. At the end of the war, she was in London, but still in the army. I was thousands of miles away in war-ravaged Poland, which now had a puppet communist government and was practically under Soviet occupation with tightly controlled borders. Winston Churchill would soon call the status quo the Iron Curtain that fell across half of Europe. Part of our eastern province, which where my family came from, was no longer part of Poland, even of this uh, annexed or controlled by Moscow part of Poland. And our whole town of Lvov was lost to us. That entire region was ceded to the Soviet Union by the Treaty of Yalta, which was signed in Crimea between President Roosevelt, Winston Churchill, and Stalin in February of 1945, just before the end of the war. It was the price the Allies agreed to pay for Russia's alliance in defeating Germany. It became part of the Soviet Union and eventually was incorporated into the Soviet Republic of Ukraine. The name of my hometown was changed from Lvov to Lviv. My parents' alma mater, John Casimir University, was renamed Ivan Franco University, named after the Ukrainian poet who lived, died, and was buried in Lvov in 1960. My mother could not risk returning to Poland if caught, and she would have been either put on trial, as I said, or as a spy and executed, or at best shipped back to Russia, uh, Russia's Gulag. Either way, it would have been a death sentence. Our chances for a final reunion seemed close to nil. In London, my mother became fascinated with English children's literature, and her favorite was Winnie the Pooh, 
In her wallet, she carried a tiny newspaper clipping of a skipping Christopher Robin. But how could she ever recover? Well, recovery she did. And that is the sequel of her story. I started this talk by saying that my memoir has now morphed into current affairs. What Putin is doing to the Ukrainians today is a mirror image of what Stalin and the Russians did to the Poles in 1939, 80 years ago, and across these very same lands, that Eastern province. Now thousands of Ukrainian citizens are being rounded up, packed into trains and shipped inland to Russia, to what are euphemistically called filter camps. Thousands of Ukrainian soldiers have been taken prisoners of war, either executed, like my father, in that earlier execution around Kiev, with their hands tied in the back and a bullet in the back of the head. That's how the 15,000 officers were, Polish officers were executed 80 years ago. And they were either executed or carted off, destination unknown. It is often said that history tends to repeat itself. And this story is a case in point. Thank you. Did I, ex I exceeded? Thank you so much. So any questions maybe from the audience or from Zoom? Uh, I want to say thank you. It's been very fascinating um, for the historical perspective and also very touching. I have to say there's a moment for me it was very touching. I've been very lucky to have never lived at work. So um, I, I, we could talk, and I think that we could talk over lunch, but uh, I'm interested a little bit in, in the title because maybe you explained to us in the beginning, but I don't know if it's uh, the, the previous is all these uh, adventures that you have. And also um, and the, the title and also um, there has there has been so many anecdotes, you know. You you just mentioned how your mother and you got united. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about. Well, that's what's in my book. Okay, so <laughs> you know, that's the solidarity it. network. So it's not that I don't want to talk about it, <laughs> but you know, as it is, I have to watch the public's eyes start to blaze over. <laughs> so I want to make sure I don't put anybody to see. And. Uh, Yes, that that's the book is the book is very personal, and like Dr. Tornetsky mentioned, it is a very personal story. Now, you know, if somebody is really interested in my mother's persona, then the book is a good source for that. But I've been giving quite a few talks to people, book clubs. Uh, even other types of organizations, but where people are not really, you know, this is an exceptional group. This is an exceptional institute. But most of the talks I gave, I had to explain basically where is Eastern Central Europe? Yeah, the maps are well, very it's true. <laughs> you know, it's true. And as Jacek mentioned, people are familiar with World War II onwards, but the changes that World War I brought are now are not really very much discussed. And yet those changes were really earth-shaking. Just imagine, just the right to vote. The right to vote. That women standing for election. Women, yes. or, or my mother, who you know uh, really shocked the family when she said, no, no, I don't want to get married right now. I, I, want, to, I want to go to law school. A weirdo, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, that's what I have in my book. Maybe, maybe it's too even personal, too family oriented. But that's the reason why, you know, to tell the story, you have to explain where it comes from. So, why the crossing, uh, crossing the bridges? Quite many titles, believe me. Nothing seemed to fit. <laughs> crossing the, that in most cases I think people like myself who you know we we considered ourselves until the fall of communism we considered ourselves political expats and this was a very particular very strange generation it was different from all generations which emigrated for 
uh, economic reasons. My family and my, my, even my own generation was people who could not go back to their homeland for political reasons. And that it was a different ideology, uh, you know, different motivation, so to speak. And uh, that's why I wrote the book because people don't realize that there were many, for example, from Poland, there were many immigration, emigrations. From, from the end of the 19th century or in the middle of the 19th century, like the Irish, like, like some of the Italian. But they are different. They, they are different immigrations and mine was definitely a political one. So uh, the book was also meant to explain why somebody like my mother couldn't go back to Poland, grab me by the hand and said, oh dear, we're going to live in Italy now, or we're going to do those things were not possible. So it took enormous courage, enormous risk, try to change that. Uh, crossing the bridges, there were, several, there were several bridges in the story, but it was also mentally crossing the bridges. Because, you know, for people like myself and even more for like gen my parents' generations, you know, those were people in the late 30s, 40s, in the middle of their active life, suddenly the life was turned upside down. They lost everything. They had to start from new in countries that didn't really want them afterwards. They were, you know, they were great heroes while the war lasted, but they were a nuisance when the war ended, when there were no jobs, when there were no. So these things were all very much a part of this story. And there were bridges to cross. And, you know, I, I, I kept thinking about the name and I thought, well, crossing the river, crossing this, crossing that. And I was visiting some friends in, actually in France. They live in Provence, they're Polish friends. And I was sort of, you know, moaning about it. I, I don't know what title to, to give this, this book. And, and uh, the husband in that couple said, well, why don't you call it Bridges? Uh, we have also some uh, about the current situation of what the expectation possibly the current situation with, with Ukraine, you know, because you have mentioned at the, at the end, I just wanted to hear about you know, uh, this. Okay. You know, uh, the last talk I gave, somebody said, Well, you know, the region, which of course I don't because I left Poland at the age of seven, so <laughs> not exactly. But yes, I've been following everything very closely. Um, but uh, the, uh, the, the particular person in the public said, "What do you? How do you think this is going to end?" I said, "If I knew, I'd be sitting in Washington, not <laughs> not in Summit, New Jersey." Uh, so the, the, it's a horrendous situation, and I I don't think anybody can predict. We all would. At least I know I would like to predict, because I know what that horror of war means for these people. You know, do I do I uh, miss my hometown? Yes, I do. Uh, I still feel very strongly about it. Uh, it was a beautiful town. It had beautiful. It was very closely uh, associated with Vienna. Well, it, you know, for 120 years, it had this beautiful secessionist architecture. It was the hometown of my parents and my grandparents and so on. But, you know, there are geopolitical situations which force a certain configuration. And you might like things differently, but you have to accept situations as they are. There are people living them. And right now, these people are being massacred. And I think it's horrible. Anyone else? Oh, who took care of you when you were in? Ah, nice question. Thank you. My mother's brother and uh, sister-in-law, my uncle and my aunt, who were in the same house when my mother and my grandmother were. We, we all moved into my grandmother's house. She lived a little bit in the suburbs, not in the city itself. And both uh, my, mother, my mother's and my uncle's apartments were taken for Russian officers. <laughs> 
So uh, my mother moved with me to the house and so did my uncle to my grandmother's. And when they were arrested, they were on the list. You see, the families of these murdered officers were especially being targeted for deportation. That's why I was on this list, listed as part of the family. And when they came to arrest my mother and my grandmother, my uncle said, I'm the son, I'll go instead of meaning my grandmother. And that KGB officer said, your turn will come. She is on the list. And then they claimed, well, there is a child listed. Where is, where is she? A soldier, a Russian soldier, followed my aunt to a bedroom where I was very, very sick. And my aunt said to him, she won't survive if you take her. And he looked at me, turned around, and said to my aunt, swear that you will take care of her and walk out. So yes, that's part of the story. That's all. That is the tone of my story. Unfortunately, I had to give a very historical background to explain where the story comes from. So your father was murdered? Yes, he was one of the 15,000 Polish officers who were executed over a period from February, well, March, to April for two months. Uh, in Poland, the month of April is always commemorated as the so-called Kati month, which is a commemoration of the executions of 15,000 Polish officers. See, not only were those, uh, those were mostly uh, people who, uh, reservists, and those were, the intellectual elite of Poland, those were professors, lawyers, doctors, engineers, uh, teachers. Uh, and those were the ones who were being targeted in particular, both by the Russians and also by the Germans in the Western part of Poland, who Germany took. See, Poland at the outbreak of, uh, moment of the outbreak of war had about 31, 32, million citizens. Poland was very diverse, ethnically diverse, but majority were Polish, but Poland uh, had 10% of the highest percent of Jewish citizens in Europe were Polish. And when Poland, when the end war, uh, war ended, Poland had lost 20% of its entire population of citizens. And I'm talking whether they were Christian, Jewish, Muslim, never mind, Polish citizens, of which there were 3 million who were murdered in the Holocaust. There were other 3 million who were both murdered partly by the Germans and another million and a half by the Russians. So Poland lost 6 million, and those were people who you would call the intellectual middle class. Because it was clear that if the war ends differently, those will be the people who will start leading the opposition to the Nazis, to the, to the Soviets, to communism, and to the rest. So they were the prime targets of all these massive human destruction. Those officers, there were exhumations made when the, when the German army reached a certain point, they found in one of those prisoner of war camps, uh, and war dug out some human bones, the Germans started unearthing it. Turned out those were mass graves. Those were ones in Russia, in Katyn. The, the other two were in the other republics. And the Russian, the Germans wanted to use this, this as anti-Soviet propaganda. So they uh, call in the International Red Cross. So it was known afterwards, after the exhumations, how these officers were killed. They were the hands tied in the back, bullet in the back of the head, thrown into ditches. Some of them were still alive. And how the dates were known, because many of them had diaries 
or notebook still on their bodies. So it was easy to determine because the Russians tried to pin that on the Germans, that crime. But there were plenty of documents, plenty of diaries. People had the uniforms, of course, you know, after two years, whatever was left there. But this was in Russia. That's very cold winter. So everything was pretty well preserved. And, and when I was reading about how the Ukrainians, how they found the, the, in Bucha, mm -hmm. the, the mass grave with soldiers or civilians even with hands tied in the back, shot in the back of the head. All I could think is of my father. Some things don't change. There is a mentality in some nations or peoples who just does not change. And Mr. Putin seems to be part, not all Russians are like that. Many Russians are suffering from that. But unfortunately, the wrong character is holding the steel, you know, the ring. And I just have one of my own questions. Just that. I mean, I know some of the slides. I know, I know it's the uh, end of the quiz, but please be gentle on me. I will. And since I read the book, I'm not going to give away anything. <laughs> okay. But when I was reading the book, I was always very curious because going with with your question, the um, the execution of the people at Hatton. I mean, this was a massive cover up after after the war. So even though even though everybody knew that the people died, you know, in Poland and even outside of Poland, it was very difficult, even impossible, to get any information on this names, everything. So, um, so even though people knew it happened, but to get any information or to find out whether their loved ones were actually there was extremely difficult. So. I was just wondering when I was reading your book, when when did your mom actually, did she know towards the end of the war? Did she, no, or? during the war, the Poles, when the Germans uncovered the first grave, the first mass graves. And the reason why it wasn't known is because, uh, you know, even though Russia attacked Poland, but Russia ended the war as one of the victors after, after Hitler invaded Russia changed his heart, right, and moved into it. So the Russians became part of the allied allies. And uh, the, the allied countries like, like the United States, well, especially Britain, France, you know, they, they were also extremely weakened by the war. So Stalin managed to put enough pressure Unfortunately, President Roosevelt believed in Stalin's promises that he was going to allow free elections and so on. And, and that part of Poland, which was incorporated into the Soviet Union, like my part of the Poland that's now part of the Ukraine, which is the Western Ukraine, which is very different from, by the way, the Eastern Ukraine, both in population and in general culture. And, that was, how shall I say, a gift to the Soviet Union from the Allies for supporting the war effort, which could have gone either way without the Russian. The Russians threw masses of cannon fodder into that war. And that's what Mr. Putin is doing now to it. For him, human life of Russians doesn't seem to matter. So that's the reason why nothing was, as long as Poland was under Moscow's control, the topic of the mass executions of Polish officers was absolutely taboo. Could not be brought up, you could end up paying fines or your parents could be kicked out of a job or you'd be kicked out of school. So for 45 years, this was top secret. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate your patience.
Thank you to those joining us via Zoom too, which will, um, and everyone else is welcome to stay. Have some foolish uh, cookies and other sweets and uh, other stuff.